Hi everyone, welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org, the world's largest and greatest live nature cam network. We're looking at live footage of Brooks River, a beautiful, if not chilly, fall day along the river. Bears doing their thing, looking for, uh, for the last of the salmon this year. And to help us talk about the bear and salmon activity at Brooks River, I'm joined by my co-host, Park Ranger Chris Kleesrath. Chris, great to have you along today. And uh, yeah, I know you were admiring the view before we started uh, the broadcast today. Oh, it's just beautiful with the snow on the mountains and some of the other, uh, when we go down river a little bit, the, the colors are still beautiful. Um, it's great to be here and uh, take advantage of uh, another few minutes to talk about the bears and the salmon. And speaking of downriver, we do have different webcams that we'll have at our disposal today. So we're looking at downstream from Brooks Falls, but there's also a Falls Low camera that focuses more on the waterfall itself. And then uh, about 100 yards downstream, the Riffles camera that looks upstream towards the falls. And at the near the outlet of Brooks River, um, a camera there as well that had been looking at a bear family probably for about that last, at least the last half hour. And I was hoping they would stay there <laughs> at least for the beginning of our broadcast, but they look uh, a little camera shy right now. So that, um, perhaps that family is moving on, but we'll, our camera operators are gonna watch for their return. That's uh, number 504. She has a couple of beautiful yearling cubs. So those are second year cubs. We'll look for them a little bit later in the broadcast. We also can go up on Dumpling Mountain to get a more panoramic view of the area. So this camera right now is looking directly east towards Mount Patolanat. And that's a prominent mountain that's filling most of sort of like the background there. And then uh, Mount Griggs just kind of peaks up over Mount Katolanat towards the upper right. And that's one of the highest mountains in the park, a very large volcano. So uh, to get started here, again, uh, you know, different webcams, but where are these webcams located? I know it's after Fat Bear Week. Maybe we have some new viewers joining us. So let's take a quick tour, as I always like to do at the beginning of our play-by-plays. Brooks River in Katmai National Park is located about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. And the river itself is about one and a half miles long. So really just about three kilometers. It's bisected by Brooks Falls. In this view, it flows generally from left to right. And along with our webcam partner, the National Park Service Explore.org hosts and maintains several webcams at Brooks River. The signal from those webcams is sent wirelessly to a couple of radio repeaters up on Dumpling Mountain, where those signals uh, or those repeaters send the signal to the small town of King Salmon about 30 miles away. Let's take a look at a closer view of the lower half of Brooks River. Today, you know, we have the Brooks Falls camera at our disposal on the left-hand side of this uh, satellite image, the Riffles camera uh, just downstream of there, and then also, um, you know, the River Riverwatch camera um, available to us as well. Chris and I are gonna try to answer a few of your viewer questions uh, that were submitted in advance through Ask Your Bear Cam Question. You can find a link to that in the featured comment. Uh, below the live camera feed on explore.org, any of the bear cam pages there, or if you're watching on YouTube, just ask a moderator for that link. We'll also try to identify some of the bears along the river that we see. It's hard at this time of the year, but um, if you want to learn more about the bears, this is probably your best starting point, Bears of Brooks River 2022. You can find that on Katmai National Park's website. And before we get back to the cameras, one last thing that I want to mention, very exciting. We're hosting a fundraiser right now for the Katmai Conservancy, which is one of our partners uh, for Explore.org, helping us to run the webcams and support Katmai National Park. Uh, and Explore.org has generously uh, agreed to match all donations for uh, the Katmai Conservancy during this Otis fundraiser uh, up to $200,000. So thanks to everybody who has donated so far. That fundraiser is uh, happening through Saturday and uh, we'll be hosting a live event about uh, to celebrate the, the end of the season of the bears in the summer that was. Uh, former Katmai National Park ranger and documentary filmmaker Naomi Boak will be joining me for that. That'll be through, uh, 4 p.m. on the Brooks live chat channel, 4 p.m. Eastern time on. Saturday. 
So with all that being said, Chris, you know, uh, we just got done with Fat Bear Week. We just crowned a champ. And it really does, you know, it's starting to look like, yeah, the end of the year <laughs> at Brooks River. Uh, looking downstream here towards the cut bank area, a lot of times bears like to hang in, the, in that area. But quite a difference from just a month ago when the, everything was fully leaked out. It's changed tremendously. And I'm so excited that we were able to uh, enjoy Fat Bear Week and Crown 747. Um, I think it's, it went well and I'm really excited about how many people participated. Yes, more than a million votes this year in Fat Bear Week, the largest ever. So this was certainly the biggest Fat Bear Week. Thanks to everybody who participated in that. Um, it's a little sad, you know, to host Fat Bear Week. And then, you know, because in a sense, we know that, uh, you know, the season is, is coming to a close. For a lot of bears, they're still working hard to get those last fat reserves before winter. But I do consider this time of the year to be peak fat for the bears. So overall, they're looking uh, pretty good, if not elusive right now. But there is a bear on a river watch camera downstream looking for um, dead and dying salmon. A couple of bears in our frame right now. I'd be surprised if there's too many of them left down there. It's been a while. Um, I think the cameras have shown the bears catch a few either uh, silvers or sockeye in the last couple of days, but not too many. Yeah, the, the behavior of the bears over the last several days had indicated to me that there's not a whole lot of salmon left in the river this year. And of course that fluctuates from year to year, depending on the, like the size of the salmon run, the timing of salmon spawning. Generally the sockeye salmon spawn spawning season peaks in September and it quickly diminishes once we get into October. So, you know, we're coming up on mid-October now, so there's just not a whole lot of fish. Uh, but Chris, one of the clips that I pulled from earlier this week um, happened to be, if I can find it now, happened to be of a, a couple of fairly sizable uh, adult males that were using the lower river. And if they were you know, still, you know, especially the coho salmon trying to migrate upstream of the falls, I think we would see these big guys up there. Um, so this is uh, from the 12th. So actually just yesterday, this is uh, number 856 looking for fish in the lower river area. And he is one of the more dominant bears along Brooks River, looking really great, really big for himself. But he's one of those bears in the fall. You've probably seen him up there before uh, at Brooks Falls where you know, if, th if there's a, a strong run of, um, you know, a late run of, of coho salmon, he's going to be at the waterfall looking for those fresher fish rather than scavenging salmon downstream. Well, he may have got, been the champion, but he is just huge and beautiful. So um, I don't think the loss has phased him any. Yeah, he is a 856 is a very large bodied bear. It may be a little bit hard to tell from this perspective because you don't really have a good sense of scale. Um, you know, there's no, of course, no person in the frame where you can you can tell, uh, you know, just how big 856 is. But he's probably five feet tall at the shoulder when he's walking on all fours. So he's a really tall bear, very large bodied bear, well filled in. Like you said, Chris, yeah, beautiful animal. Uh, he's since he's so dominant. Uh, you know, you would expect a bear like him to have like more scars and wounds on him, but he doesn't have a whole lot that are visible at this time of the year. Maybe none, actually. In this clip, when you see a bear kind of like moving through the water quickly with his face in the water, uh, like he was doing there, that's a, a bear that's seeking uh, a sockeye salmon. How long do you think he'll, I mean, you've been around a little longer than me. How long do you think he'll stay down uh, before he's back up to hibernation. I think he's here for some of November as well. You know what? I'd be surprised if we saw, you know, a bear like 856 hanging around throughout the end of the month. I bet he disperses. Uh, he may have already, you know, taken a little bit of a walk, come back. You know, bears are omnivores. Uh, they they are heavily reliant on sockeye salmon in the in the Brooks River area, but you know, if they can go out and find some berries, you know, that's good for them as well. Um, you know, combining salmon with berries is, is really like the ultimate bear diet. <laughs> it helps them maintain muscle mass while at the same time they can put on body fat. So um, 
So I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt if you know he he decides to move elsewhere, especially if he's not finding, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of food rewards by searching through the river. So that's a you know a clip of eight by six. But yesterday, also there was another large male in the vicinity. Uh, this is, I think, maybe a couple of hours before eight five six. Um, number thirty two chunk, another fat bear week contender. I think we had seen um, in a while. I haven't seen him at the falls in a little bit. Do you think that the larger bears are hanging out down river more so because it's a little more relaxed and more energy efficient to just kind of move around down there and look for dead and dying ones? That's my that's my assumption is is you know that the, the falls just isn't rewarding enough for them to hang around. We're still seeing bears doing that from time to time. Uh, you know, bears standing on the lip, checking things out. In fact, if we head up the Brooks Falls right now, there is a bear on the far side of the waterfall sitting in the far pool. Big guy. <laughs> so this is another large bodied bear here. This um, maybe we'll get a better look. I'm not going to try to risk an ID. Um, right now, but this is certainly a, a large adult male sitting on the far side of Brooks Falls. I just, yeah, I just don't think that they're having, they're finding much success up here um, at this time of the year, although we're still seeing bears occasionally catching a few salmon. So I think um, energetically for them, it's it's more re rewarding for them to scavenge fish downstream. I think it's easy to forget that they're omnivores because the bears at Brooks are primarily eating fish, whereas elsewhere where their um, diets are much more varied because they don't have the access to the food re resource that are, that the brooks bears do. The salmon are uh, especially helpful when it comes to helping them gain their weight, but bears in other places just don't have that. That's a good point. I mean, if you were only learning about bears through the webcams at Brooks River, you would think that these bears, that brown bears in general are, are like are, are mostly carnivorous um, in that, you know, other other bears uh, across other brown bears across the world are going to be seeking out primarily meat when that's not the case. They will eat meat when they can get access to it. But most brown bears don't have that luxury. So in a sense, the bears here at Crooks River have it good because, you know, they can sit and wait for their food to come to them. But if you're a grizzly bear living in like Glacier National Park in Montana, for example, this time of the year, you're trying to get fat on berries. So you're seeking out like the last of the blueberries, if there are any around. And, um, and blueberries, you know, they're really high in sugar, but they don't really have a lot of protein in them. Um, so some bears, if they're eating, you know, solely berries late in the summer, they can actually lose a little bit of muscle mass while they're putting on fat because uh, the, the berries don't have enough um, protein in them. So again, it, it kind of goes back to like this, the, the idea that if you're an omnivore, like a brown bear, and you can eat meat and berries, you're, you can really do well for yourself. Once they decide to work, um, I think we had a question uh, submitted that asked how how far and how long it took to dig a den. And I did some research and found that it should take them three to seven days to dig a den out for themselves, uh, with the males probably being the last to actually uh, enter the den. Uh, and I think we've discussed before that the dens are probably anywhere from a mile away to several miles and we really have no idea where these bears go is that correct yeah that's my understanding as yeah, well the um let me pull up that question for everybody uh so we can put it on the, on the screen here if my production software side of things works um yeah, but um, as a, as far as I understand, yeah, it can take them several days to dig a den because it's not that they don't have the strength to dig a den in a quicker period of time. Um, it's it's that they're just really lethargic <laughs> by the time they end up um, 
getting to their their chosen den site. You know, their their metabolism starts to slow down uh, well before they enter their den. Their heart rate starts to slow down, so they're just not feeling energetic um, when they are ready to go in into their den. So yeah, I think it can sometimes take several days, but we don't have a lot of observations of that. I don't think there are any for the Katmai area. Uh, when the bears are going into their dens, it's usually November. So, it, you know, and that's a rough time of the year uh, to be up in the mountains <laughs> in the park. Bears do fine with it, but it's it's not so great for people, um, even if you're really well equipped for that sort of um, that sort of weather. So I never I never tried to go out and find, you know, bear dens at, at this time of the year. I kind of left left the bears to do that. And maybe I uh, do my best to discover the uh, the empty dens in in late spring. This bear, Chris, didn't stick around that far pool very long, um, moving to a different location. Again, I don't know if that's because it, it realized maybe there wasn't, um, you know, many fish swirling in there. A lot of times bears can, when the water is high like this and there's a lot of, you know, air bubbles in it, they can still feel fish kind of bumping against them. And the way patient. I think the ones that see at the falls you know, enough, often use that, wait for the fish to come by and, and pick them up. Um, but I don't see, you know, obviously we haven't seen any really jumping in a while. So there must be the ones just swimming around the base of the falls. Yeah, and if any, any salmon do get up, like right up against the base of the falls, I think those are probably fish that are um, very late spawners. And they're just kind of looking for the right place in the vicinity of Brooks Falls to, to spawn. So a question maybe Chris that we can answer now that came in in advance is about like identifying bears. And I'm going to admit right now um, that, you know, we've had several adult males um, that kind of use the, the, the far pool area at this time of the year that kind of look the same. Um, number 602 and 474. I mean, there are differences in their body uh, shape and size, uh, little differences in fur color, facial features and things like that. But are, this question was about like, how are you able to digitally, or, or are you able to digitally label bear IDs during the live camps? It's so hard to ID a lot of the bears. Um, so uh, I think we can maybe talk about some of the strategies that we use to identify different bears at Brooks River. But to get to this, um, the first part of this, um, this question here, currently there's not technology to digitally label the IDs on our live cam, or ID the bears on the live cams. However, um, Maybe that technology will get there in the future. Uh, there's uh, a few researchers working on facial recognition software for brown bears, and that shows a lot of promise for helping to advance the study of brown bears using like remote camera traps and things like that. Um, so anytime we can, you know, reduce the necessity of going out and handling the animals, tranquilizing them, and you know, putting a, like a GPS collar or something like that on them, if you can track them across the landscape. You know, without having to do that, then that's better for the wildlife. Um, and it, it, I think it would be a fantastic thing if we were able to, like, you know, have a switch toggle on and off that would identify a bear um, on on the camera. We don't quite have that yet. Um, but if you're struggling to identify the bears at Brooks River, don't worry. I still struggle. You know, it takes time to get to know some of the animals. But Chris, when we're when we're looking at the bears, what what are some of the main things that you look at almost immediately when you're trying to figure out? which bear is who? So I'll be honest, I'm much better at identifying them in the spring uh, when their coats tend to be much more varied than they are now. They all seem like very large, dark brown bears right now. But I tend to look at their ears, uh, the shape of the ears, the color, something distinctive like grazers ears uh, being very bright and fluffy, uh, their snout, whether it turns up or 
uh, but has a large scar, uh, scar across it, like someone we know and love. Uh, even the Popeye who has the massive biceps or, uh, and one of my best ways I identify them is scars. There are so many that have distinctive scars that you can look for, or Otis's patch that looks like a seven on his shoulder and his wonky ear. Uh, I just try to find something unique to that bear and, and try to put that together when I'm looking at them. Yeah, it, it's difficult yeah, at it, first. You, you know, you're really going to want to look for, you know, some of the more obvious features that can be unique. Um, you know, just this bear, this bear, in a sense, you know, looking at it right now, is kind of generic in, in its appearance because it has medium brown fur. It doesn't have scars uh, that are visible. It's a large bodied bear. So you can, you know, make a, I think, a, a safe assumption that it's an adult male, even if we don't get a better look at it. But other than that, you know, it can be really difficult to tell them apart. But yeah, look for those things, especially early in the summer. It can be a lot easier to identify the bears. So come back if you come back and watch the cams in June and July, you see the bears returning at that time of the year, much skinnier. The, a lot of their scars are, and wounds are visible. The fur color is maybe a bit more distinctive at that time of the year. Um, so yeah, if you're struggling with identifying bears, um, you know, don't fret. It's something that we all uh, go through and still go through, even though I've been, you know, watching bears at Brooks River for um, about 15 years now. And I can hardly believe it's been that long. It seems like time has really flown by um, in, that, in that while. Uh, younger bear here though, Chris sitting on a rock uh, downstream of Brooks Falls is not really willing to get into in, in the water to to look for fish. Sometimes we'll see bears, you know, jumping right off of this uh, rock if they see a, a fish swimming underneath them. A lot of times though, they just kind of use it, it seems like as a, as a place to perch and rest. I can't say I blame them. I talked to the rangers in King Salmon this morning and I believe it was about 19 degrees. So I would imagine the water has chilled quite a bit. And even for a bear, that's cold. It certainly is. Yeah, if it was 19 degrees in King Salmon this morning, it, um, the water temperature is not very warm. We haven't, you know, seen ice starting to form on, you know, uh, it looks like at least from when we go up on Dumpling Mountain uh, and we can get a good look at the lakes. It doesn't look like ice is starting to form on the lakes yet. So it hasn't cooled down to that, like that temperature where it's going to start to freeze, but it is uh, quite chilly and that bear moving out of the way pretty quick, which means there's probably another bear in the vicinity that is uh, approaching it. And it does, that looked like a smaller, younger bear, which means the other bear was probably larger moving through the vicinity. Yeah, he definitely had a little incentive to leave. So, but if you look uh, back to Dumpling, if you can, uh, that is a lot more snow than when I left two weeks ago. So it's definitely, the weather is definitely changing. Um, we were thrilled that there was some snow at all when I left. So it is definitely uh, accumulating and uh, looking more like uh, late fall and headed into winter. <laughs> And bears do den on Dumpling Mountain. So, um, I know we had a, a question about that. I uh, don't know if I'll be able to find it here. Uh, but yes, bears do den on Dumpling Mountain. So, um, you know, a lot of times people wonder, uh, you know, how far away are the dens? Yeah, that was the question. There it is. Let me bring that up for everybody. Here, I am acting as uh, the studio producer as well as partly color commentator here. So that's why it's taking me a that's little right. bit longer to get things rolling. But uh, oh, that's the wrong one. Anyway, <laughs> I did my best. Uh, but somebody was wondering, you know, again, how far away are, uh, are the bear dens? And they can be anywhere from just a few miles from Brooks River to... Um, to a few dozen miles. In fact, um, you know, those mountains far off in the distance, Chris, uh, it's, it's hard to tell how far away they are because the air quality right now is so great across the, the Katmai region. It's just so clear. Those mountains on the, her, the far horizon, you know, you're looking at 40 miles or, or more uh, of the distance to those far peaks on the Aleutian Rains. Um, so, so yeah, some bears will maybe go um, you know 40 miles away, but a lot of them are just going to the the, the mountains that are closer by. So Mount Katolanat, that's about 12 miles 
um, straight line distance from Brooks River. Um, you know, it's going to be a farther walk for for a bear, and that's you know that that's the mountain on the horizon, right in the center. And then some of the other mountains in the near vicinity, like the one in the foreground, of course, where this camera is located, Dumpling Mountain, bears will go there. And then um, Mount Coez is another area where bears in the past, the Brooks River had been tracked to make their dens. And that one's, I think, maybe about six, six or seven straight line miles away from Brooks River. And we, we tend to forget, we think we focus on the bears of Brooks Falls, but there are last estimated 200 in the entire park. So it's not just the Brooks bears that are looking to make dens. So Fortunately, there's plenty of room for them to all find their own. Yeah, plenty of good denning habitat throughout the park. It is, uh, you know, not in short supply. Bears like to go to sort of medium elevations in the mountains and in places that collect and hold a lot of snow, but also have a lot of vegetation. Um, steep slopes with those combinations help to make good dens. The snow insulates the dens. Um, the vegetation helps to uh, stabilize the uh the dense structure overall and uh yeah a lot of a lot of a lot of space for bears to make a den another adult male here looks like um coming to the waterfall and this is one um that a lot of viewers know as number 89 uh he's nicknamed backpack he got that as a spring cub because he uh, had a tendency uh, at that age to ride on his mother's back his mother 435 holly was a contestant in fepper week uh this year we haven't seen holly around the river in a while, at least not that I'm aware of, but yeah, one of her offspring still cruising around. I hadn't seen him much this year, but he's, he's looking good as well. It looks like he's ready. Uh, but I think he's just going to scout out a little and see if he can find a couple of fish up there. Yeah, moving to the far side of the falls, sticking his face in the water again, looking under the water for salmon that happened to be in the vicinity. He will fish in that far pool. Let's see if he goes over there and, and kind of sits down or if he's going to you know, be paying attention to the bear that's a little bit farther downstream than him. At this time of the year, the bears really don't have you know, much incentive to interact um, unless they want to play or something like that because uh, at, the, at the waterfall, you know, there's really no good fishing spot right now just because the salmon aren't migrating anymore. Um, but we have seen bears you know, interacting at the falls still, even at this time of the year, if they come a little too close together. Water's still really high. There's a there's a rock that's I was just, just about a, to say the same actually, thing. <laughs> yeah, there's a rock that's uh, you know just, you know that this rock, Chris, just to the right of backpack where he's standing there that um, often is exposed, and it's completely covered covered now. Can't even see it. He even seems to have trouble like staying in one spot. I, that water looks like it's moving pretty good still. Yeah, where he's paused just for those few seconds is kind of like in the lee of that large boulder, which helps to deflect a lot of the water flow. You can see his hind end getting carried a little bit farther <laughs> downstream there than his front quarters. So yeah, I think that water current is really strong. It looks like he's trying to make his way over to the office. Perhaps because it's out of the way, maybe this current is not as strong in that little corner. This definitely looks like a spot where bears can can sit comfortably, not have to expend any energy fighting the current. Uh, also, they can have their back against the wall there, which um, gives the advantage that they don't have to worry about a bear sneaking up uh, from behind on them. Uh, and catch it, maybe catching them by surprise. But that, you know, he's just reached forward a little bit there. I think that's just sort of like a blind feel, you know, kind of testing the waters, so to speak, looking to see if there are any fish, you know, right in front of them. Sometimes we'll see bears sort of lunging in this area um, because they have learned that salmon often will, will pause or hold in that spot.
interesting thing about uh, I agree with you though. I think, uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Chris. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think you're right on the money. I think that uh, with the wall behind him and uh, the fall on the right-hand side, I think that's, he doesn't feel like he's got to worry as much with someone sneaking up on him in that spot. I think that's the appeal of the office to pretty much all of the larger males that stay in there. Yeah, Backpack's not a little guy either. Uh, he's he's never been super aggressive. You know, we at least not that I can remember. I mean, he stands up for himself when he needs to. But he's not one of those bears that's really motivated to get into the face of other bears and challenge them for fishing spots, things of that nature. So he seems to be a bit more patient um, in that regard uh, compared to some other bears that we see uh, at the river. So if he can avoid confrontations, that seems to be like, you know, his his preferred strategy rather than getting uh, getting involved in them like we see with uh, bears like 856 or or one two eight grazer who is a, a female bear, but all, all, often very assertive. Backpack's also a little uh, lighter in fur color than a lot of the uh, other adult males, especially um, you know bears like Chunk and eight five six seven four seven. They tend to be and one five one Walker. They tend to be very dark in color. Um, but he's a little bit of lighter brown. He's certainly more blonde than those other bears that I mentioned in the in the springtime. And a question that we did get was, uh, why are females more likely to be lighter in color than males? And I don't know if anybody has, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know if anybody has uh, researched that specifically to see if, you know, what sort of genetics uh, components are going on to um, create that, but on average, female bears aren't as darkly furred as male bears, especially adult males. Adult males tend to be more, uh, their fur color tends to be darker than, than females. But I don't know if there's a reason why that is. It must be tied to the sex chromosomes, but I, I don't really know. Uh, I'm not sure either. I, I personally believe it's uh, genetics, which, um, but I can't find anything, any specific papers on research done on it, but it is true that it seems that the females are lighter than the males, and I can't help but agree with you and think it's uh, tied to the sex chromo uh, chromosome and and just more likely, I don't, but definitely I would say genetics, because if you look at uh, 435 and 335, they're both very light, and uh, in fact, 335 is a little lighter, um, where some of the other bears are that's definitely a genetic trait. So, um, and even as she got darker, you can see she's really not nearly as dark as what we're looking at, um, even as dark as 89, or uh, definitely not as dark as 747. Yeah, so this is uh, the Fat Bear Week photos of 435 Holly, uh, early summer and late summer. And you can see that, you know, she's still fairly blonde in uh, in both seasons. It has that beautiful toasted marshmallow look to her in late summer. Uh, 89 backpack. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, he, he just kind of carries a little bit of his mother's lighter colored fur, I think, as he moves out of the far pool here, not finding success in that spot. Maybe looking to go a bit farther down the river, scavenge um, fish there. That other bear that was in the vicinity has moved out of the way. Not sure if it was moving to avoid backpack or if it just decided, you know what, I just want to <laughs> go try my luck somewhere else. He may be headed down the river with the rest of them. Maybe they're doing a little, little better fishing down there. And if you're just joining the broadcast, thanks for uh, tuning in today. Or if you've been with us from the beginning at the top of the hour, uh, thanks for being here. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. My co-host for this uh, Bear Cam play-by-play -play today on October 13, 2022, is park ranger Chris Kleesrath. We're looking at live footage of brown bears fishing for salmon and doing other things at, at Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. Uh, Mike, one of the things that you and I were discussing earlier, because you had uh, sent me a, a clip, was um, how you can tell the difference between a 
coho and a sockeye salmon when the bears catch them. Do you have those clips available? I do. Let me pull those up. Because, we, yeah, we do have a couple of clips of bears catching um, coho salmon in the far pool of Brooks Falls. Sometimes you'll also see those salmon called silver salmon. Um, but they're not silver, of course, <laughs> uh, all the year, especially when they're when they're um, or when they re-enter or when they enter freshwater and spawn. So this is, uh, I think, Bear Four Seven Four in the far pool. We'll see him in just a moment catching a, a silver salmon okay. right in front of his face. Sockeye salmon are beautiful animals, bright red bodies right now, green heads. The silver salmon, though, when um, 474 picks uh, this fish out of the water, will look a little bit different with the greenish back and pinkish sides. They also have spots on them, too, which the sockeyes generally lack. So if you get a really good look, um, you're looking at a, a salmon that lacks spots, uh, spawning salmon, that is, then you know you're looking at a sockeye. So he's going to turn and eat it, turn. you know, out of our line of sight, take it off of the river. So we're not going to, you know, have a chance to, to really examine that fish closely. But yeah, uh, they're sort of like that olive green back and pinkish sides. Those are indicators of uh, a coho salmon. They also have a white gum line, which I think if I, I might have a gif of that. Let's see. This is, um, yeah, a couple of coho salmon from our underwater camera from a few years ago not the best quality but um maybe a, a little bit of a better look the one on top really hasn't transitioned into its spawning colors yet the one on the bottom has and you can see they have you know a very exaggerated um, hook jaw but also a white gum line and then again that olive green back and pinkish sides and that contrasts quite a lot with the sockeye salmon which have um, green heads and bright red bodies. Chris, though, that, that wasn't the only clip of um, a bear catching a salmon in that far pool. Let's take a look at Otis and his success over there just a few days ago. That'll give us a better look at that um, at those coho salmon. So Otis over on the far side where Backpack was in our live footage not too long ago and he's going to catch a fish here fairly shortly and he, he just does it with ease too <laughs> even you know looking at this clip and some of the other clips it's amazing how easily otis catches fish in that far pool You can actually notice the white gum line in that picture. Yeah, and Otis really, you know, he yeah, turns into this fish pretty quickly and, you know, and throws it down his, down his gullet. Um, so we can't, you know, we don't get that great of a look of the, of the fish. But yeah, all this, all of, you know, colored back there. Um, and then also uh, look at the flesh color too. You can see that the flesh color really isn't, um, isn't white yet. It's not, it doesn't have that bleached out look that a spawned spawned out salmon has the pigments that make salmon flesh pink uh, are transferred to a salmon skin and if you're a female salmon the eggs uh, so after a salmon is spawned i mean its flesh is just really pale pasty looking almost um compared to that fillet that pink fillet that maybe we're used to if we order salmon at a restaurant or we buy it in a grocery store or if we're fortunate enough um to, you know to live in an area where we can catch our own you'll you know you, you don't prefer necessarily the the spawned out fish it's it's the pre-spawning fish that are richer in fats um that a lot of people like although there are people that have developed for a, you know a taste over time you know you, whether it's traditional or just something that you have gotten used to that will eat um the the spawned out fish uh, bears take what they can get of course um otis isn't isn't going to waste you know much of which this fish at all 
No, mid-season he might be high grading that fish, but right now there's not many to go around. He's going to enjoy every bit of it. And he's paying. It looks like he's paying particularly particular attention to the brain case there. Um, that's maybe like the last one, sort of like morsel of fat that's left on, um, you know, salmon that have been in the water for a long period of time or freshwater for a long period of time, because sam when salmon re uh, uh, return to freshwater, they stop eating so all of their spawning and migration efforts have to be fueled by their their energy reserves in their bodies so you know by the time they're done spawning they just have really nothing left but uh, i know that some fisheries biologists have hypothesized that the brain can stay has to stay a little bit fatty just because you know they they need you know maybe it's 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 necessary for brain function uh i don't know if anyone's you know, looked at how how closely they've looked at that, but that's at least one hypothesis I've read about that. Of course, salmon brains aren't that big overall, um, so it's maybe just like a little little pocket of fat. Um, you know, if you're eating a cookie or something, maybe it's like having a you know finding that one chocolate chip. Um, you know, in in the cookie itself. So good worker there, Otis. Um, Chris, you mentioned that that uh, sort of sh seven shaped patch. As it, this clip ends and it pauses right here, you can see that sort of light shoulder patch. Um, that is one of those really identifiable characteristics of Otis at this time of the year. And it does carry through to the fall. It's uh, I think it's harder to distinguish when he first shows up and he's a little lighter, but it stays pretty light. So you can identify him by that pretty much the whole season. There was a bear in frame at Riffles. We just missed it as it walked out of our view. So again, that's, you know, I think what you can expect to see as we head towards um, late October here is bears moving around a lot looking for, you know, the last of the salmon. So we're going to see a few bears hanging out at the waterfall occasionally, but it's no longer becoming, your, you know, it hasn't been that productive of a fishing spot in a while. So that's why there are fewer and fewer bears at the waterfall and more and more bears just kind of wandering around looking for the last of the salmon as they can find it. We've seen a lot of bears walking up and down the uh, banks of the river. I think that's either looking for a good spot to sleep or it's also looking for some uh, salmon scraps or even an over oversight look into the water to see if they can see any fish. And that's what this big guy's what, doing right over here just now. He, I think this was that same bear we were looking at earlier in the broadcast, Chris. Maybe could be 474. It doesn't quite look dark enough. Maybe 602. Not, still not quite sure. Um, I would, if I had to guess, I would say 602. I think he's a little darker than uh, 474. This is pretty good spawning habitat for salmon right here. The, you know, we can't really see the fish in the water, but there still are spawning salmon in this vicinity. And often when a bear's walking through this area and it kind of makes like a quick forward lunge, it's coming up on like a salmon's nest and it might see like a couple of spawning salmon there. And it's like, hey, maybe if I give this half-hearted attempt, I'll get lucky and, and catch a fish. Most of the time, the, the spawning salmon are, are too quick, um, still too energetic for the bears to catch in that manner. Hence the reason why they're, you know, again, looking for um, anything that can't swim away, the, the weaker fish, the ones that have already spawned. I think the water is much deeper than it has been in years past. So I think maybe there's some, um, they've been able to evade the bears a little better downriver where normally that'd be a little lower. Uh, it gives them a little more wiggle room to get away from the bears. That's true. As we look at Otis here, so this is live footage of Otis, not a clip that we had pulled earlier in the week. So he's out there scavenging salmon, doing well for himself. You know, uh, what a lot of the, uh, or one of the more frequently asked questions that I've gotten in the, you know, the past um, couple of months has been about the fish in the high water. Like is, is the high water detrimental to the salmon? And not at this level. 
you know, it's it's not flooding Brooks River to the point where the the riverbed's being scoured and the um, and that would like erode salmon nests and eggs away. Uh, it's it's probably helping the fish more than anything else because it's um you know that fast flowing water carries a lot of oxygen. It's cold, and uh, it allows them to evade predators. One of the questions we were um, uh, looking at earlier, I, I don't know if you can find it, it's about um, about the mom's milk for the for the cubs. Um, I did look up some information on that. Um, gotta find it. Yeah, let me let me uh, yeah, yeah, let, let me, me locate that and you can go ahead and answer, of course. Yeah, but um, we did have okay. a question about that. Um, so it's, uh, do we have an idea how much milk the mamas are producing and perhaps how much their milk cubs take in calorie wise? Uh, from what I research I did, I found that um, the bear's milk has three times as many calories in it uh, as human milk. And so it's much more fatty and uh, high caloric than, than, human, uh, than human. And uh, whether or not they consume it or not that the average bear will produce between three and four quarts a day of milk so that can uses a lot of her calorie intake just to take care of the, the babies and so um, that's why it's so important for the moms to not only take care of the cups but to make sure she uh, packs on enough pounds for herself it's amazing to think it's amazing about how much energy a mother bear puts into producing milk, especially if you have a large litter. Uh, so, you know, Otis, you know, he's packing on weight for himself, but he doesn't have to worry about cubs. A female bear, you know, certainly has to do that. Although Otis, you know, it's not like he's living without challenges in his, in his life. He certainly is. But yeah, um, it's, you know, it can be rougher for, for mother bears. But, you know, abundant salmon runs help them in that regard. It's maybe one of the, you know, it's, it's, it's the reason why, you know, Katmai has such a high density of brown bears, but also um, bears reproduce at um, greater rates in areas where they have access to abundant food. Uh, and, and in Katmai, that's, you know, that means uh, sockeye salmon uh, for the bears living in the interior of the park. And that's quite a bit of milk, three to four quarts a day to produce uh, as a bear, I would think. Uh, and that's why we see our cubs getting so fat because they're consuming that at three times the calories as human babies are. So that would explain why some of them are now chubby cubbies. And the cubs need those fat reserves to survive winter hibernation uh, because the only time cubs nurse in the den is right after they're born. All the cubs that we see on the landscape now, they're not going to be nursing in the den. They're going to be uh, hibernating and surviving on the off of their fat reserves so yeah they're they're you know going to be ravenous at this time of the year because they can't rely on um on mother's milk coming up pretty pretty soon overall so this is going to be like really their first full hibernation cycle for the the first year cubs and that i i wonder you know they're probably not uh, you know they you know conceptualizing it like like we would but um you know it's a different experience for them compared to what they um experienced right after birth when they were active in the den and nursing and playing with one another. Well, they'll have the same uh, hibernation as mom and uh, will not eat or drink the entire time. So they need to make sure that they've got sufficient fat reserves as well. This whole area that we're looking at at Brooks River, looking downstream towards the cut bank is, again, just super productive spawning habitat for salmon. Um, you know, when you go and you stand on the Riffles platform, for instance, where, you know, our Riffles camera is located and you look down into the water again, the lighting right now on this camera is maybe not conducive to seeing it, but yeah, especially like in August and September, you see just like this whole, this whole area is, is filled with red salmon, really kind of a beautiful scene. And then going farther downstream, 
um, you know, from there, this area that we're looking at in the river is downstream of the riffles. That's also just, just filled with salmon. And look at those mountains in the background. Wow, that's a lot of snow. Really pretty scene. Mount Katolinat is a spectacular mountain to to climb. If anybody has that opportunity, it's difficult to get to. Uh, there's no trails there, so you have to hike a long way cross country, or you know, hike, uh, you know, take a boat out to the shoreline, uh, and then hike straight up the mountain, which is the only way I've gotten up the mountain. But I've been up there. I've been fortunate enough to be up there a few times, um, once in July and once in September, and yeah, it's it's a really um, you know, amazing mountain in it. It, in, it doesn't have different names. The different peaks don't have different names on Mount Katolinat. It's just all Mount Katolinat. So all of the, the snow capped peaks that you see in uh, on the horizon here, that's all Mount Katolinat. It's more like a range of mountains. If you were, if this were in the, um, the contiguous United States or a more populous area, probably each one of those peaks would have a different name. But, um, you know, usually the, the place names don't get to that level of detail in the Katmai region. I mean, it's quite, did you uh, canoe out to canoe to Tolanat? That's quite a ride if you did. Uh, one day I tried to kayak, make a long story short, from Brooks Camp and hike up Mount Katolinat back in a day. And I ended up turning around partway through the day. I just wasn't that fast of a kayaker. I made it to the mountain and I hiked up partway, but I just didn't feel like I had enough time to get up there. The other times I was going with yeah. other rangers and we were able to take a motorboat um, out to oh, the shoreline. Okay. And, and hike straight up, which made made the day a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a quite a distance to be canoeing or kayaking. Yeah, again, twelve straight line miles from um, from the you know from Brooks River, uh, Brooks River, the outlet of it. In this scene here, again, live footage from Dumpling Mountain, at lower right. And yeah, if you were just to you know trace a straight line on a map. From there to the the near slopes of Makatolanet, that's going to be about twelve miles. Those fingers of land that stick out towards each other in Naknek Lake, those are about two miles from the beach at the outlet of, of Brooks River. So that can help you know give everybody maybe a, a bit of a sense of scale on how far away some of these things are. And like I talked about before, the the mountains on the far horizon, you know, you're looking at maybe closer to to forty miles or more. Those colors are just breathtaking. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, picture. golden light Beautiful at this bear. time of the year. Yeah. Perfect. Golden grass, golden bear. Fall at Brooks River is, you know, one of my favorite um, favorite scenes. It's pretty in September when you have the leaves, the yellow leaves on the birches and the poplar trees. It's pretty now. Uh, you know, the bears are, are you know, starting to disperse away. We're not seeing nearly as many bears on the river as we did just a few weeks ago. And again, that reflects back to the food of availability. So bears may be looking for other opportunities. Maybe some of those bears that are feeling their early urge to go hibernate are, are moving towards um, their denning sites um, slowly, if not surely. Chris, I can't help but think that an old bear like Otis here um, doesn't mind being in the water because it's probably easy on his joints. You know, carrying all that body mass over time, eventually, you know, that can, you know, maybe maybe not be too comfortable uh, for you. Even though bears have like really thick limb bones, you know, their 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 bones of their arms and their legs are more robust than in a person because they are carrying a lot of body mass. But uh, still, you know, it's it's a lot easier to move through the water, especially when you're buoyant like he is, carrying all that body fat. Fat floats, so I think it probably takes a lot of pressure off of his joints. Um, I'm sure that's a welcome relief um, from having to carry it all around on land. Looks like he did 
for a moment locate a bit of a salmon scrap, but decided that was not worth his time or effort. Maybe there, or maybe there wasn't just anything there to eat. Um, the bottom of the river right now is, is covered in little bits of salmon parts. So, you know, it could be like a, a bunch of entrails that a bear discarded. It could be like the mandibles. Sometimes bears will pick those things up, investigate them with their paws or with their nose, looking to see if there's any edible morsels on there. A lot of times they end up dropping them and, and discarding them. They're not usually as picky this time of year as they are earlier in September. A little bit of something to gnaw on there. You can see a gull following um, Otis looking for any scraps. Um, different birds that you might see in the water on our River Watch camera include golden eye ducks and uh, mergansers. And those those birds are going to be diving. Uh, the I think the golden eyes are probably maybe looking for like aquatic invertebrates. Um, the mergansers are going to be chasing fish, but I would not doubt. Although I don't know this for sure, if you know those those diving ducks also are going to be picking up stray salmon eggs. Again, I don't know that, but um, you know that's just a a food source that if it's accessible to them, I can't see them passing it up because a salmon egg is just like a, a just a packet of fish oil. And you eat enough of them, you can really get a good meal out of them. The bears don't ignore them when they can when they catch a fish that hasn't laid its eggs. Um, and you know, I, I would I would suspect that the ducks certainly um, know to pay attention to that as well. That's kind of what we talked about as far as the salmon's contributions is they not only feed the bears, but they their eggs feed other animals. Um, when they die and decay, they add nutrients to both the water and the land. So uh, they deserve a little contest of their own, I think, or a crown of their own for their contributions to the whole entire ecosystem. Yeah, next year, here it comes. Slimy Salmon Week at Canada <laughs> National Park. We'll see if we can uh, get, that, get that contest going. I don't know if we'll have the same level of, of engagement as Fat Bear Week. But yeah, when you talk about athletes, mm -hmm. At, at Brooks River, you know, the salmon are it. They, you know, they migrate upstream and spawn without eating. Um, they migrate thousands of miles in the open ocean. They come back, you know, again, without, uh, you know, the use of maps or GPS, they just, they have it all that, it, you know, it's internal within them. So they have those instincts to navigate by perhaps, um, you know, the magnetic field, maybe the polarized light from the sun, things of that nature. Um, and then they smell their way upstream, remembering the sense of home essentially. So yeah, they are incredible creatures. And I'm thankful that uh, they are able to provide for, um, you know, the bears and the people of the Bristol Bay area. Well, Chris, it's been um, great talking to you today. This has been a, an enjoyable play by play. We might have one additional one next week, depending on bear activity. So we'll, uh, we'll schedule that maybe next week. Uh, we'll, we'll wait to see what the bears and the salmon are doing. But Chris, yeah, thanks again for your time today. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. That was my co-host, Katmai National Park Ranger, Chris Kleesrath. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. Continue to watch the bear cams over the next, uh, you know, couple of weeks or so. We're still going to see bears out there you know, meeting the challenges that they face, looking to survive in the, in the best ways they know how. So until we talk to you again, uh, enjoy the bears. Have a great night, everybody. <laughs>